Hi everybody, welcome to the September 4th, 2015 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on a Denver District Court judge reversing a zoning board's decision on a new building being built by the Denver Rescue Mission. Natasha Gardner from 5280 Magazine. Um, it started out, I guess, it was zoned for as a community center, and then it was argued in court um, by the Ballpark Neighborhood Association that it wasn't uh, a community center, uh, and they've apparently at least won this round in court. What do you think of the decision? It's just the latest chapter in a very long saga involving this particular building or structure, because it's, it's more of an outside center where people would be able to go and spend time during the day. Um, you know, on the one hand, you can understand that area of town has a disproportionate number of the homeless services in the city. But at the same time, where where are you going to put them? No neighborhood really wants this in, in their backyard. And as a city, again and again, Denver has said that this is a population that we care about, that we want to do something for. So this pedantics over the zoning is a community center or not, is there a door that goes between the old structure and the new? That's what we're coming down to. But I think the, the more important question is, how do we deal with this homeless population? How What kind of services do we want to provide? And where are we going to do it? David Kopel from the DU uh, Law School and the Independence Institute. Um, legally, is there, I, I thought I saw a comment from the Denver City Attorney that there might be an appeal, but I don't know how that would work. If, does it go to another court if they wish to appeal? Is the building used? Well, I mean, the building's already been built, so it's not like this is something that is still in the blueprint stage. H how does this, this decision affect what we currently have? Sure, it can be appealed to the Colorado Court of Appeals, but the Judge Michael Mullins, who issued the ruling, and is a very experienced and, and well-regarded Denver District Court judge, his job is not to define homeless policy for the city. All he is allowed to do and what he's required to do is apply the law. The existing zoning law is that a homeless shelter like the Denver Rescue Mission is not part of, is not, it, the, that area is not zoned for something like the Denver Rescue Mission to exist there. But because the Denver Rescue Mission preceded the zoning law currently in effect, it's what's called a compliant use. They're grandfathered in. But when they want to expand their homeless shelter, that doesn't get the advantage of grandfathering. What they wanted to do was they build a daycare center, essentially, for the homeless. It wouldn't have beds, and they, there wouldn't be a door between their existing homeless shelter and their new daytime activity center uh, with courtyard and lunch and things like that for the homeless. I think Judge Mullins correctly ruled that that is a non-compliant use. It can, it's not compatible with the existing zoning law. It's a, more, it's a larger homeless shelter. It's not a community center. You could argue that the city council should change the zoning there, but they, that's not his decision to make. Right. He just enforced the existing zoning law as it is. Eric Sonnen, a political analyst. Uh, we have a neighborhood that the, the rescue mission has been, has been there for years, back when it was really Skid Row. Uh, you built Coors Field 20 years uh, ago. Uh, now you have million dollar lofts right down the block. So is this something for the city to start to manage? Is Was it inevitable because of how Denver's developing? What are your thoughts? Well, it's an inevitable conflict as the ballpark neighborhood grows and as it certainly gentrifies, gentrifies on steroids. I don't know if the disclosure is, is relevant, but uh, since I left my consulting firm over a year ago, but before I left, we did some work with the Ballpark Neighborhood Association, so I'll, I'll just put that out there, but that's way past tense. I think, uh, as Natasha pointed out, th these kinds of tensions are inevitable. They're going to escalate. As I read the judge's uh, decision just uh, in the last few hours, uh, and David touched on this, I think the real rub was that they sold this as a community center, but what it really was, and clearly in documents dating back a long time, was an expansion uh, of, 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 the, of the center, of the shelter. Mm -hmm. And I think the judge probably rightly ripped their hands and ultimately overturned uh, the decision because 
at the end of the day, it was not intended as a community center. It was intended as a shelter expansion. Uh, and he said, let's at least be straightforward and transparent about what the intentions are. And making his debut on the program, Sal Thomas, political activist and director of Rue Black Pack. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, your thoughts on the issue? Um, I would like to touch on something that Natasha said in terms of it being pedantic or semantic. This idea that um, it wasn't presented as what it should be. Um, I personally am trying to still find the difference between a community center and a homeless shelter. Um, I think those words, when we utilize them and we don't utilize them interchangeably, we're sort of demonizing the aspect of the homeless people who live in our community. Uh, they are very much part of our community, so having a center uh, that works with them and affects them and helps them would indeed, in fact, be a community center. Um, if the issue is with the semantics, um, I don't think that's going to go away when they change the semantics, because frankly, I think what it is is an issue with continuing to demonize a certain aspect of our population. Um, I don't necessarily think there is so going to be something uh, that alleviates this quickly. Um, whether it's one building, whether it's called a community center or it's, it's called a homeless shelter, they're still serving our community. And so I don't think the, the pedantics are really what people are fighting against. I think people are fighting against an extension of something that because the city is changing, because it's gentrifying on steroids, um, is a blight. And it's a blight we don't necessarily want to admit to ourselves because we do have the power mm -hmm. to change it. And I think that's kind of the issue here. Two days after President Obama secured enough votes in the U.S. Senate to sustain congressional action disapproving the Iran nuclear deal, Michael Bennett announced that he will support the deal. Bennett also announced on Friday that he will present the legislative plan that would increase security funding for Israel. Uh, Natasha, this um, it was, uh, I think, great timing from our, our, our Senator Michael Bennett that we heard about this on the Friday before Labor Day weekend. Um, I'm glad that we'll be able to cover it here on this program. I'm not sure how many other programs will be able to cover it between now and then, but he was a holdout. He was one of the 10 um, uh, undecided senators, and two days ago, the, the, the deciding vote was, I guess, you know, or at least the deciding person who would re restrict opposite action in Congress was made in Maryland, so it was a little bit safer to come out. Mm. Uh, just well-played politics or a, uh, a well-reasoned delay from our friend Mr. Bennett? Probably a little bit of both. I think that the timing is, is not a surprise. Um, I, I think that his decision to support it is not a surprise either. And let's be clear, we're dealing with a double negative here. I mean, people are choosing to back the deal so that they can sustain a veto. <laughs> it gets really, really complicated after that point. Bennett, though, making his decision to make the, the to announce late, though, I think says that his seat is a little less steady than Democrats in Colorado probably want it to be because he wasn't willing to be that deciding vote, that, that flip vote that would change history essentially on this particular deal. Um, and then not surprisingly, Cory Gardner, of course, has come out against the Iran deal. So we're, we're sort of seeing politics play out as expected, um, but I do think that it was good for Bennett to put his name on one side of the fence or the other. David, the Iran deal has been huge nationally, really internationally, but when it comes to Colorado politics and next year, regardless of the timing, what effect do you think of Bennett's stance will have on his race? Well, Colorado, like the nation, is roughly two to one against the deal, so it will be harmful now, and let's just say he gets elected and then reelected and he's up 12 years from now. Then when Iran has the nuclear bomb, and intercontinental ballistic missiles, which this deal authorizes it to buy, uh, he's going to look especially bad and will be in a disastrous situation in part because of him. Now, to his credit, he consulted with Gary Hart, who favors the deal, and Gary Hart is certainly a, uh, a person with, a, with decades of expertise on security issues, although I think he's making a mistake on, on this one. Senator Bennett is helping two fundamental transformations of President Obama. One is a drastic U.S. retreat from the Middle East in general with the intended purpose of elevating Iranian, Iran's sphere of influence. The theory is that the only reason the Iran Iranians are radical Islamic revolutionaries trying to impose their totalitarian system everywhere uh, is because the U.S. has been mean to them, like in supporting the coup that overthrew their government in, in 19, 1950s. Uh, but I think that's a serious misunderstanding of the genuine revolutionary ideological fervor of Iran. Um, and secondly, the transformation of the United States towards the ban banana republic model, the Caudillo model of South America, where we have the most consequential treaty of this century. And 
Obama refuses to submit it to the Senate for ratification, where it would not come close to getting the two-thirds necessary to ratify this extremely important treaty, and instead the Senate and the House acquiesce in this Caesarist power grab by Obama and set up a new procedure whereby the deal goes into effect unless they can maintain, get a two-thirds majority uh, to vote against it. That's the opposite of what our Constitution says. Eric, you have to follow both Caesarist and Banana Republic, so good luck, first of all, with, with your comments here. But uh, I guess my question goes to, uh, it seemed that Senator Bennett wanted to kind of have a kick and eat it too. I support the Iran deal, but I'm going to submit a legislative plan to increase funding for uh, Israel's defense, which may or may not go through, but I guess I, 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 I personally am a little suspect of a legislative plan so like coming from one senator uh, on something as big as security funding for Israel. That, that, you don't just submit that for, for passage. Uh, how did you take the decision that came down today? I took it as predictable um, in many respects. The Friday before the holiday weekend, the Friday before the vote. Uh, Michael Bennett is a serious guy. I don't think you can just make this binary. Did he do this out of political expediency or did he do this on its merits? Life is complicated. It's probably a mix of both. He's a serious guy. He talked to other serious people. I know he took the issue. He, 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 he thought about it with some, uh, some diligence. On the other hand, as David points out, yes, the state, like other states, is approximately two to one against the deal in terms of public opinion. But the other factor that is critically important is that his Democratic Party base is in favor of the deal by probably 80 to 20 or 90 to 10. And so he is cross-conflicted there. He set it up so he was not the deciding vote when Barbara Mikulski from Maryland made her announcement 48 hours ago. That became the deciding vote. You have to keep in mind, this is not a vote to approve the deal in as much as, I mean, because there's no way that President Obama would ever get anywhere near 50 percent support uh, in, in the Senate uh, to do that. This is simply a vote so that uh, you know that a veto could be sustained. Gotcha. To the bigger issue, and I'll try to be quick about this, I, I used the word binary earlier. The whole way this has been formulated and presented to the American people is binary. Either you are for this deal or you are against this deal. And my criticism of President Obama, whether it's on this deal or the Cuba package or whatever, is when you get to this position, obviously it's an up or down vote. But he had it within his power to create a better deal. And right now, whether it's the U.S. Senate or the American people in terms of their opinion, you are faced with a binary choice, either yes or no. But the choice is an unfortunate one because there is no good answer out of that, either out of that yes or that no. But if you could dial back the clock or if we had more skillful negotiators, either in the White House or in the State Department, maybe you would have a better deal and this country would be facing a better, more palatable choice. Sal, wrap it up for us. Um, I think with uh, Bennett in general, the Democrats were pushing really, really hard. It was a party line thing within the Senate, and those who had not jumped to immediate support had seen a little bit uh, more blowback and pushback uh, in general. So this was one of those things that they were going to, I feel like, as Democrats have to fall in with the party line. Having said that, between the 34th vote and I believe the 38th, eighth vote that would be here, there was three more people who said, yeah, I'm behind it. So Bennett wasn't even the the person right after uh, the 34. So I really think he was hedging his bets. Um, and I don't really think in terms of the Iran deal, well, I understand why there might be some opposition to it. Um, it's by no means uh, bilateral with only two parties. This is a seven, seven countries are, are dealing with it. Seven, seven powers are dealing with this. So in terms of the binary, yes, in, in the United States, you're either with or against the deal. But frankly, the deal hasn't been explained uh, very well to the American public. The idea that um, Iran may or may not still have the bomb is, is true to an extent, but the level they're allowed to enrich their uranium is so low that it's not weapons grade and it won't be for 15 years versus a military conflict, which most experts have said will only uh, stop it for about three or four years. So it could have been a better plan. I don't disagree with that, but I think there are a lot of aspects to it uh, that aren't allowing for a clear view of it. It's, it's being made too binary. 
Douglas County school officials announced this week that they will appeal a Colorado Supreme Court decision that overturned its voucher program. Officials hope the United States Supreme Court will rule on the constitutionality of Colorado's Blaine Amendment. Uh, David, as our esteemed lawyer at the table, you know between what the Blaine Amendment means and what chances it might be, since you have actually argued in front of the Supreme Court on a different issue, but you've been there. What are your thoughts? Well, actually, on the, the day I was at the council table, the Supreme Court helping Alan Gura in the Heller case, uh, another lawyer in the room was this guy, Paul Clement, who was the Solicitor General of the United States, taking a uh, position in between what we favored and what the D.C. favored. And our, my side ended up winning that one, but he, of course, gave a good argument. He's now in private practice. He's representing Douglas County. He is the top constitutional litigator in the country. He doesn't come cheap, but he also doesn't come easily. Uh, because he's at this extremely high level, he has a reputational interest in only, and you can see it in the, what he's, the cases he's taken, he doesn't always take cases that are sure winners, because if they were a sure winner, you wouldn't need to spend all that money on him, but he takes cases where there's a realistic chance of success. And so he knows the court immensely better than any human being in Colorado does. And the fact that, he, that he's taking it, I think means there is a reasonable possibility that Douglas County could win this, especially on the grounds that our Blaine Amendment, which is don't give money to religious schools in, in our state constitution, as interpreted by the state, the Colorado Supreme Court, was much more extreme in how much it requires government to disfavor even uh, religious schools, even in a neutral sense, like just the ordinary services that, that any business might uh, receive. So I, I think it's his best chance of success is on challenging the extreme version of the interpretation here uh, rather than all Blaine amendments in other states being stricken down because those have been interpreted more moderately in other states. Eric, as we're, we watch uh, education issues like this uh, like crazy here at this table, uh, as you see this move, uh, what do you think of its chances at the U.S. Supreme Court, well, even at the U.S. Supreme Court taking the case? Don't know. I'm not an attorney and I'm certainly not esteemed. <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess I have two quick thoughts on this. I, I wouldn't hazard a bet. In terms of my personal commitment to school choice and maximum amount of choice possible, I believe that applies to Douglas County as to any other place. But in terms of where the epicenter of this fight should be, Douglas County is not the right poster child. I mean, I think you're much more concerned with school choice in urban settings where there are truly miserable schools where kids need and desperately deserve some kind of exit pass or some kind of alternative. To the Blaine Amendment, which dates back, I mean, there are 30 some states around the country that have some version of the Blaine Amendment in their constitution. It, that, that movement started back in the 1870s. And it is rooted in some of the worst bigotry this country has seen. In this, in, in this case, it was anti-Catholic bigotry. And that's what a lot of the opposition to voucher movements, including this recent Colorado Supreme Court decision, was, was rooted in the Blaine Amendment. You can argue in favor of vouchers. You can argue opposed to vouchers. You can have substantive and intellectual uh, discussions on either side of that issue. But for the opposition movement, whether it's teachers union or other, to ground their case in this kind of bigoted background, bigoted history, I think it's shameful, I think it's unbecoming, and I would love it if the U.S. Supreme Court throw the voucher issue back to various states, let various states take their own path, but let's not ground the opposition in some kind of 150-year-old anti-Catholic bigotry. So, what do you think about the chances of uh, Douglas County's appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court? I do think it's reasonable that it will happen, just because I can see the logical argument um, in the interpretation of the Blaine Amendment. Um, I think what confuses me about this situation is if the Blaine Amendment, um, or the, rather the interpretation of it, is held up, if the religious natures of the schools in Douglas County isn't changing, um, I'm not sure what would change with the actual um, decision. If they decide that these are in fact religious schools or religious institutions, I don't think they should be receiving um, state money. And uh, almost to the tune of, I believe it's $2.3 million is what that program was trying to do. It was um, about $5,000 for every uh, student, and it was a possible 500 students. Um, so I don't necessarily think that drain is uh, justifiable. Um, and to quickly to the voucher point, I think the issue um, 
with vouchers with this specifically is that when you have something called school choice or you have parent choice, um, ideally it makes a lot of sense, but pragmatically what it is is you're actually removing students uh, from lower performing schools, um, which removes money and funding from those schools. So it doesn't actually do anything for the schools or for the population. Um, all it does is for that individual student or that individual student's parents allow that choice, but that choice isn't bettering. Um, the school and it's not really bettering the education program in our country in, in general. So from a two-pronged thing, I really don't think uh, Douglas County is doing anything positive. And um, as a last point to that, while the Blaine Amendment is couched heavily in anti-Catholicism, um, I don't think that another ideal behind it, the separation of church and state, is necessarily bigotry. So if we could find a way to work around this um, the, the bigoted Blaine Amendment, but still find a way to address the fact that we do need separation of church and state, and we shouldn't be using um, state funds for institutions and organizations that aren't taxed. Um, I, I would be more in favor of something like that. Natasha, uh, the voucher argument, uh, the education choice argument in Colorado is not going to go away, uh, mm -hmm. regardless of what happens this particular decision. But how do you think this appeal to the Supreme Court will uh, affect it? I think there's a possibility we spent more time at this table talking about this than the Supreme Court <laughs> will spend talking about this particular topic. That doesn't mean that it's not important, of course. Um, you know, and it, this is something I'm learning as somebody who's cared about education my entire life, who's followed policy, but as a, as a mom with a young son, I've had to look at education policy in a totally different way. And I think situations like this and conversations like this, while they may not always rise to the Supreme Court level, need to be, to be had. I mean, what's the best education system for our children? Where is the best way to spend our funds? What type of schools? How does choice play into it? Those are all conversations that do need to be a part of it, whether the Supreme Court says, yeah, we'll take this on or not. Let's get a quick take on this last one. The Denver City Council approved a settlement this week for a total of $860,000 resulting from a lawsuit against two Denver police officers. In the 2008 excessive force incident, James D. Moore reported being hogtied and hit in the head by the officers, and eventually the charges against him were dropped. Uh, Eric, what's your quick take? Almost speechless. I mean, this guy was a disabled vet. The cop who assaulted him had had 39 other internal affairs complaints. I continue to believe that the majority of Denver cops are honorable and doing the right thing under often tough circumstances. But whether it's this guy, Sean Moore, or Ricky Nixon, who we talked about around this table a couple weeks ago, who they fired you know, back in 2009, but it was finally another six years later and a second firing to make it stick, there's got to be a way to get rid of the bad apples. This guy was a bad apple. The amount of money, whether it's between the sheriff's department and the police department that we're paying out in either judgments or settlements is getting quite expensive, but the human toll is either even greater. Sal, your quick thoughts on this one. Um, touching on that, but bet since 2004, um, between those two departments, sheriff and police, we've spent almost $13 million um, on types of cases like this. I unfortunately think this is indicative of of a lot more uh, than bad apples. I think it's uh, indicative of something systematic. Um, I think it's at the core of uh, the police department, unfortunately. I think there is, um, it's colloquially referred to as, as the blue shield, but I think seeing how long this took and seeing just how many, 39 I believe you said, how many incidents um, have gone unspoken for or unpunished, um, it's, it's unfortunate. And, and just like in a classroom setting, when you see someone uh, getting away with something 39 times, you begin to lose faith in the authority of the teacher. You begin to think you can get away with those things. And that's what I equate um, a lot of Denver police officers to. I'm sure many of them are trying to do the right thing, but that becomes near impossible when you're faced with a system that is corrupt and somewhat unjust. And I think this is indicative of that. Natasha, your thoughts? Um, one thing that's important to note is this is a 2008 incident. It's now 2015. And while there has been a massive effort recently to, to have a, clo a quicker closure on these type of cases, that's still way too long. Mm -hmm. That's way too long, and it says, you know, not only that people can get away with it, but they can get away with it for a long time. We need faster turnaround on these cases. We need them not to happen in the first place, and I think that starts in the academy, and that starts with the cops that we recruit to be part of our peacekeeping force. David, wrap it up for us. Well, the police academy does not teach people to brutalize folks. I, I wouldn't put any blame on, on them. Uh, kudos to David Lane, who's the winning lawyer on this. We might we should change the title of the show to the David Lane Show, <laughs> since we're seem yeah. always talking about uh, things, including his victory uh, last week on uh, the jury nullification, free speech rights of, of protesters. 
systematically, the change we need is that the people of Denver County need to have, have the same right as the people in almost every other Colorado county, which is to elect their chief law enforcement officer. Make that person accountable to the public, and I think you'll get results, which we have not never gotten under the current system of appointment uh, by the mayor. The mayor's too indirect in practice uh, for the people to be held accountable for police misconduct. John Hickenlooper never su suffered an iota of political harm, uh, despite the fact that this went on in his administration, and that was certainly not the only uh, example of, of Denver police misconduct in his administration. Let's get to our favorite part of the show rather quickly. Disgrace of the Week, Natasha with Patty out of town. You, the honors, start us off. Well, I think the easy, easy Disgrace of the Week goes to the Kentucky clerk who refused to issue marriage licenses. I'm not sure I have to say anything more than that. He summed it up well. David. Well, CU football lost again to Hawaii, but which is, I'm sure they, they, they tried their best, but let's remember this was a top-notch football program that was destroyed about a decade ago by what turned out to be malicious, fabricated, no evidence charges that people on the football team uh, were involved in, in criminal sexual assaults. Eric. So many options. We ought to do a whole show of disgraces <laughs> sometime. The situation on the 16th Street Mall in Denver, it is getting to be a crisis. Uh, it is getting to be a shambles. The mayor and others need to get control of it. We talked a couple weeks ago about some visitor who was assaulted and the delayed police response time. You now have a recent story about five separate sexual assaults by the same perpetrator. Uh, that's the urban core. It needs to be a magnet for people as opposed to a magnet that p pushes people away. So. The second and third quarter of any Broncos game. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they will improve. Uh, say something nice with somebody, <laughs> Natasha. This week at City Council, a young boy named Nathaniel spoke um, about his fight with childhood cancer. Um, he urged people to wear gold in the month of September to support funds and efforts to find cures. David. Attorney General Kaufman for joining the multi-state lawsuit saying that the Obama plan uh, to jack up electricity prices is not something that the Obama administration has the legal power to do. And besides being on the right side of the law, she's also on the right side of social justice because skyrocketing electricity prices se severely harm poor people. Eric. I didn't know Saul was going to go to the Broncos on his disgrace. <laughs> I'll go there on my say something nice to Peyton Manning. We'll see what kind of season he has. But one thing you know about him is he's a person of honor, and that juxtaposes him to somebody a couple thousand miles away who plays quarterback <laughs> for a, a New England team. I think you may have heard of that story. Sal, so wrap it up for us. I was actually going to say the first and fourth quarter. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice and balanced. I like that. <laughs> that is all the time we have tonight. Thanks for tuning in. For everyone here at Channel 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. I'm Larry, audio guru and time machine producer for Colorado Inside Out. Today I'm in my role as audio guy. I've just received the lineup for today's episode of Colorado Inside Out. And the first thing I'm going to do here is actually make sure all my microphones are working. Besides, if you're going to borrow a microphone. Got five microphones working here, and as you could probably hear in the background, we hear background chatter in all of those things. The next thing I'm going to do here, this mixer we have, Digital Console, actually has the ability to remember the different participants in our shows on there. So what I'm going to do now is go in and find here in the list all the people that will be participating in today's show. David Copel, Patricia Calhoun, the queen of the show, the actual true star of the show, Dominic, 
the new and engaging host taking over from the popular Raj Chauhan. And now all those people's uh, voices, the tunings that I've created for those individuals uh, have been entered into the board and I've got them to where they'll sound at their absolute best when the show starts. If you watch the uh, shows here, you'll, you'll note that the microphones are typically on the side facing the host if someone's on a lapel. That's so when they turn to Dominic, there's a mic between them and Dominic. If they turn the other way, if they turn the other way, he'd be gone. If I put the mic over here and he's talking at Dominic, we don't really hear him. If I have the chance and someone's wearing a tie and I expect they're going to be turned into both ways in the audience, we'll try and place it on the tie. If you see that, somebody on the tie, it was because it was either really convenient and easy to hang it on their tie or because we expected they'd be having to turn both ways to address different panelists. And so that ensures that we pick them up. The next step in the process is to go get a cup of coffee and talk to Dominic. Hey, Simon, how are you? Why, well, it's good to see you. We're having our uh, usual Friday cup of coffee, and it's always, uh, as always, it's a kind of Larry and Dominic tradition, if you will. It's uh, it's some of Columbia's finest, if if you will. But it's it's what makes CIO what it is. It's it's something where everyone has to be on their toes. Now that's uh, there's nothing there. It's all about the beans, man. It's it's always been about the beans. You ever want to know what the secret behind Carbon Sad is? Good coffee. <laughs> I'd like to thank my agent and to all the members of the Academy for making this possible. Welcome to the September 4th edition of Colorado Instant Out Post Game, a special web exclusive production here on Channel 12. Let's get a quick take on the Denver ballot issue that would have allowed marijuana in private establishments. It was pulled this week from the 2015 Denver ballot by its supporters. Mason Travert said the new goal is to work with city and business leaders to create a compromise measure. Natasha Gardner, senior editor of 5280 Magazine, um, it sounded like a pretty savvy political decision. I mean, it was the day before the November 2015 ballot would be ratified. Uh, pulling it now, seems like the spidey sense of said it probably wasn't going to go very well this year. What do you think of the comments and the move? I think that's exactly what happened. And I will give um, this whole effort a, a huge kudos for having the sense along the way to take these moments to step back or to push forward. In many ways, legalization has happened almost in light speed uh, uh, pace for, for the political world. So for them to say, okay, it's not quite time for this to go in front of the voters, I understand that. The problem is it still leaves us with this, this horrible loophole of where do our tourists consume pot and, and beyond tourists and our own people outside of their, their private residences. And that's what the initiative was going to look at. The fact that they're going to try to do that through the council should make for some very interesting city council meetings, but I think it's going to be a very complicated process. David Kopel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. Uh, that last comment sounded politically savvy for a Mason, um, but I don't know really how far it can go. I mean, I imagine there's probably some Denver businesses that want to get involved in this kind of industry, but it certainly it's not the majority of them. Do you think it's just a, uh, a retreat with honor statement, or is there actually some realistic chance that he could work with some businesses and government officials? My guess would be, reading between the lines, that they made a tentative agreement to make an agreement with the city of Denver. 
and the city on the one hand you know recognizes that they're making an enormous amount of tax revenue off the legal marijuana business and secondly Denver more than any along with say the ski towns probably has the most marijuana related tourism which again brings in a lot of money and so the Denver City government recognized that exactly that the problem Natasha talked about that if they're going to come here to, le to legally use it well then there should be some place where they can not only legally buy it but consume it so my hope is then the Denver government will work to craft something that is narrower than the ballot proposal but still addresses the issue and by being narrower it might take into account for example the concerns of adjacent businesses things like that that's what I, I think is most likely is we'll get something that goes in the direction of what this proposal was doing but has more restrictions limitations zoning all those kinds of things but but gets us over the hurdle of providing a place where out-of-towners can lawfully consume without bothering other people Eric Sondman, political analyst. Uh, as Natasha noted, the, the whole movement of legalizing marijuana in Colorado has really moved politically at light speed. And we've also seen the political maturity of the movement uh, grow almost exponentially from uh, you know toga protests with the incident of toga and, 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 and a beer outside of a, uh, a patio to something now where it sounds like they're trying to work realistically in the political framework. Do you think it's going to work? I don't know. I mean, I was impressed w with David's very moderate tone here and, and middle ground approach. I want to, for his benefit, be very clear and, and Im immoderate in my, in, in my comments. Uh, first of all, I have to believe that maybe Mason Tavert and his allies had some polling here, that this wasn't a decision to pull this absent some sense of, of political reality or, or perhaps what the fall election w would have in store. I hear Natasha's comment about, you know, the, tr the pot tourism and these people need a place to, uh, to partake. And I guess my comment is, you know, hashtag first world problem, shall we say, or um, <laughs> of all the crises facing this city or this state or this country, if, if, if that is a, a first tier crisis, then we're in pretty good shape and I'm not convinced we're in that great shape. <laughs> Sal Thomas making your uh, premiere debut here on Colorado Inside Out, uh, political activist and director of Rue Black Pack. Uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, big move from Mason Trevert and his supporters? Um, many and complex, but I will try to keep it uh, to just a few. <laughs> it's, um, it's just a segment show here. Yeah. So yeah, 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 um, I do, I do think it is a smart decision in general. Um, to touch on something that Natasha said, I think the reason that um, it, Perhaps the, the voting public may not be ready for it, um, A, because it's been moving at light speed, but B, there's still a very large need to decriminalize marijuana and generally both uh, philosophically and pragmatically. Um, there's sort of a public consumption blowback that's, that's been happening both from natives and non-natives, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. It's not just something they feel forgive the pun that's hanging around in the air. It's, it's something that we actually need to discuss, and this sort of idea of a compromise measure isn't, isn't I mean, I'm not sure legally if this is the case, but isn't very tough because I'm thinking of something like cannabis clubs, um, spaces specifically where individuals who come here to purchase marijuana can go to smoke marijuana without um, putting anybody else in harm's way, without bothering anybody, specific places to consume something that you've uh, purchased legally. Um, I don't think it's analogous to the cigarette smoking thing. I think a lot of arguments have tried to make it analogous. If I can't smoke cigarettes, you know, why should I be allowed to smoke? Mar and, and the issue is there aren't hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, tactics to make the consumption of marijuana, um, or rather the consumption of cigarettes, as negative as the consumption um, of marijuana. It, it sometimes comes down to a philosophical uh, issue, and I think that's what the core is here, and I think that's what um, Mason realized. He and everybody over at Normal kind of thought, you know what, this is still too philosophically laden, things are still moving too fast, um, let's see how we can approach this with a compromise measure, and I think it was a smart thing to do, because this would have been something uh, opponents could have pointed to uh, pretty largely as something that failed, and the legalization of marijuana for as fast as it's gone is still somewhat tenuous, and a defeat like this could spell uh, the first crumbling brick, and I think Mason realized that. That's all the time we have for Colorado Inside Post Game this week. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. For everyone here at CPT12.org, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for watching.